My name is Ione Fitzpatrick and I'm the communications officer of the Batson Churches Project. Um, I'm assuming that most people have heard of the Batson Churches Project. Um, that's probably how you found yourself in this bizarre event on a Friday afternoon. Uh, but uh, for those of you that um, are less aware of the project and what we do, we are a pretty unique partnership between the Church of England, the Bat Conservation Trust, the, Cons um, the Church's Conservation Trust, Historic England and Natural England. And we are funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And essentially what we do is we are trying to help churches with bats to find a place of peaceful coexistence, um, which can be easy when there aren't many bats and can be more challenging when there's a lot of bats. Um, and Thornham Church um, is the church that we are oh, admitting to more people here. Thornham Church is the church which we're focusing on tonight. Um, and they have had a bit of a difficult time with their bats. And you'll be hearing a little more about that um, as we go through. And Thornham Church has Pipistrelle bats, uh, which are one of our project ecologists. He's absolutely fantastic and is here tonight to give the kind of main body of the talk, Phil Parker. He'll be telling you a little more about the bats in Norfolk in general and um, Pipistrelle specifically. Um, so first, of all, first off, you'll be hearing from uh, Megan Grief of Thornham Church, who we caught up with uh, last week, I believe it was, and um, you'll hear that in a moment. I believe she's here tonight um, as well, which is fantastic. And you will then be having a wonderful tour of the absolutely beautiful Thornham Church, um, particularly for those of you that haven't been there before. It really is stunning and filled with gorgeous things um, by uh, Rachel Arnold, who is the Project Heritage Advisor and is extremely knowledgeable. Um, and finally, Diana Spencer, um, the, one of the engagement officers on the project, and myself will be kind of behind the wings, just checking for any questions. And um, well, we probably can't solve that many technical issues to be fair between us, but we can give it a go. Uh, at the bottom, if you just kind of move your mouse and you have a look at the bottom, you'll see that there it says chat. Um, if you have any questions, you can just type into the chat your question as soon as you think of it, and we'll come back to it at the end when there's, um, we'll have time for questions. Um, if you are having any technical difficulties, I re recommend just going out, closing, and then coming back in, and that usually solves it. I know that's the old off and on, but that's about as far as my technical ability <laughs> stretch. Um, and I think that is most of what I have to say. Um, at the moment in the chat, you'll see there's just a feedback form for the end. I'll repost that at the end again in the chat so it's easy to find. Um, that's just really helpful for us. If you could just let us know how you thought the event was once it finishes. So without further ado, I will pass on to um, Rachel, who is going to um, share for us just because of <laughs> some technical difficulties this end, um, the interview that we did with Megan about the church and about Thornham's bat story. So um, here we go. Okay, thank you. Um, hello everyone, I'm Rachel. I'm, I, I only mentioned I'm the heritage advisor on the project. So it's so, so nice to see so many lovely people tuning in and um, some uh, familiar faces as well. So let me, I'm just in, it's like searching for the right window and I'll press share. Thornham has had bats for a very long time. Uh, my husband uh, was born in, in Thornham and he remembers bats being in the church. So that's 60 odd years ago. Um, but my experience of bats in the church, I've been here for nine years now. And each summer we get quite a lot of bats and there is a mess all over the, because they roost in the nave. Um, and so the mess is all where you don't want it really. For people to come and sit in the pews and down the central aisle and basically everywhere um, and we just clean it up when there's a service and if we want to do any anything else in the church just before we have to clean the church <laughs> um, but you know that's been going on and we've got used to it to a degree but it, it does limit things it limits what you can do and um, for how long 
Um, you know, we couldn't have displays in the church in the summer because, well, you just couldn't, they'd get dirty. Um, anything that's just one or maybe two days long, we can cope with, but longer than that, you know, you've really got to uh, clear the church again. Okay. So services, weddings, things like that, we can manage, but anything longer than that. So it's really just the, the sort of the mess, because I know you have run things like bat walks in the church to get people to come and look at the bats as well. Yeah, we have. Yeah, the, yeah since, um, I don't know, must be five, maybe even six years now, Phil's been doing bat nights um, for us, and people are quite interested in the bats. And it, and it has helped to generate interest rather than disgust at the state of the church. <laughs> So that that's been a positive, um, but yeah, yeah, we've Phil's told us an awful lot about the bats, and we now know where they go and where they roost and what they are, and it's 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 quite nice, really. I I like the bats. I don't like the bats they make, but I like the bats. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I think that's the same in sort of most of our churches. It's it's not the bats themselves; it's the what they leave behind. So what are you hoping to get out of being part of the project and the work that should be happening in the church? Uh, we're hoping that we will have a roost in a nice little back box near where they currently go in and out and they won't come into the nave. <laughs> but it will keep the church clean and smell free and we will be able to use it as we like. Mm. That is the hope, whether the bats have other ideas. Is is another thing <laughs> so fingers crossed in a couple of years time we'll still have plenty of bats using the church of thornham yeah but yeah. hopefully not actually in the church itself yeah yeah that is the hope i mean it, it's lovely to see them and it's lovely when they go out it, it's quite spectacular to see them one after another it's it's quite quite nice to watch them and flying down the road as well when we go for a walk in the evenings and we're walking back up at the right time you, you know you just <laughs> you don't know where to look with the bats flying everywhere okay. what's been the sort of opinion of the the church community the congregation as to the bats in the church is there any issues that have come up or is everybody think, sort of muddling I think, along i think historically um nobody liked them or nobody confessed to liking them you know, it was how can we get rid of these bats? They're a nuisance. Why should they take precedent over people and all this? But I think more recently, um, with Phil's help, it's, um, you know, they've got a bit more insight into the bat's life and um, they're tolerating them more. I think visitors, because we're on the coast, um, we get a lot of visitors and they are very interested in the bats. Um, but as I say, the lo local people, churchgoers historically didn't couldn't understand why we had to have bats in the church making a mess making it impossible for to for people to do what they wanted to do and um yeah that was the problem <laughs> mm -hmm. so we're very 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 pleased that um this project's come along to uh, help sort that out a bit mm. <laughs> Do you, do you think, can you see a little bit of a change in the attitude now they can see that things are actually I happening? Can, yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly people are more interested in in what we can do about it and, and are hope, hopeful that um, things will improve and the church will be returned to the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're all very hopeful about that as well. Hello and welcome to All Saints Church Thornham. My name's Rachel and I'm here on a very blustery day in North Norfolk um, and I'm very happy to give you a church tour of this wonderful, fantastic building. It's mostly um, medieval with a few Victorian restorations over the, t over the period. So let's head on in. From this angle we get a better view of the church and its architecture. All Saints dates back to Norman times, but most of what we see here is 15th century. The windows are huge and designed to let a lot of light in. They are carved in the perpendicular Gothic style, which makes use of long vertical lines, emphasising the height of the building. The tower, on the other hand, does not emphasise height in quite the same way, and actually looks a, a tiny bit squat. 
An antiquarian called Blomfield, writing in 1747, said that the tower had fallen down, so perhaps it was much taller before. The tower is now topped by a Victorian parapet, which was built in 1877. One of the bells in the tower dates to the 12th century and is actually one of the oldest bells in the county and maybe even the country. Even its iron fixings are ancient and of architectural and archaeological interest. Few bells of this age survive. It is a sacred bell or a sanctus bell and was rung at the elevation of the host, the most critical point in Catholic mass. So they very rarely made it through the 16th century reformation and other later religious reforms. There is another fascinating bell inside the church, but we'll talk about that when we when we get in there. So as we head into the church, I just want to point out this really fantastic 15th century door. It's oak and it's got lovely carvings um, and it's got a wicket door in the middle. And this is a smaller door which, um, which you pass through and it opens like this. And you just use that for everyday use, but for um, more important services, maybe weddings or funerals, they'd use the larger door and open the whole thing. The arch has a term, this arch, the S-shaped, um, where it points and curves around like this, is called an OG arch. One more interesting feature of the door is that there is a carved image depicting a fox preaching to a congregation of geese. The fox represents cunning and falsehood, while the geese represent a gullible and foolish congregation. The moral of the story is not to be fooled and seduced by false doctrines. It was a common tale and part of folklore in the 14th and 15th centuries. Here we are inside the church and we're at the back at the west end in front of a really nice bell. This is a ship's bell, and it was on the HMS Thornham during the Second World War, which was a minesweeper. The ship gave the bell to the church. I would give the bell a ring for you, but it's reserved specially for Remembrance Sundays only. Now we get a chance to look at the interior of the church. As you can see, it's huge and quite typical of those Norfolk churches that we know and love. It's got a wonderful 15th century hammer beam roof. Um, and also 13th century pillars. It's really interesting because um, you can see that they sort of splay outwards um, with the weight of the roof. Now I'm going to move towards the font now, which is a stone octagonal font with um, quite intricate carvings which frame um, pillars and uh, crests here. Now the font is painted, but the paintwork is not original. I'm not sure what, when it dates to, but there are um, emblems and symbols of the passion as well. Okay, so we're just looking a little bit more, in a little bit more detail at some of the paintwork on the fonts here. And this is the, this is the shield with the emblems of the passion on. And here is a, a long stick with a sponge, and up here is a spear. So just panning round, we can see the royal arms above the north door, which is Hanoverian and quite um, foliated in design it's for George II or III. The pews towards the back of the church are um, late Victorian or early 20th century. There's some medieval ones at the front and we'll have a look at those in a minute. There's a wall painting at the back of the church just there which is um, a piece of text from the Bible and that dates from around the 1630s or perhaps a little bit later. And looking up again at the, at the hammer beam roof we can see the, the stops of, of the wood coming down above the apex of the windows, which, although not unusual for Norfolk, is still a bit surprising to see. All Saints is home to some really fantastic pews with carved ends. The intricate carvings are poppy heads, there's um, animals and birds, and there's also some of the seven deadly sins. So this man here, um, his face is slightly rubbed off, but he it represents sloth, and he's praying, with counting his rosary, but he's falling asleep. He stands in uh, an open toothed mouth, which represents the jaws of hell. So, um, sinners beware, you will descend into hell if you fall asleep while praying. On this bench end is a windmill, 
And it's possible that it relates to the Miller family, who were really wealthy benefactors of the church in the 15th century. The windmill, and actually all of the benches, are really well preserved. Some of them have um, knock marks or scratches on them, but this one in particular is, is quite complete. So I've definitely saved the best to last. Thornham's crowning glory, it's, um, it's piece de resistance, is its 15th century painted medieval screen. The chancel screen would have been a lot higher, and all that survives is um, a waist-high dado rail. But it's very well preserved regardless, and it's got lots of, um, lots of figures of saints. There's 16 in total, um, and there's Old Testament prophets as well. In this panel on the end is Zephaniah. He has the most amazing hat and gilded outfit. Anybody would be, would be jealous to have that in their wardrobe. Down here is a, a dog and a dragon, and here is a lion. It's, it's really amazing. In this panel is David. You can still identify him with a name written at the bottom which says David, but he also has a harp. Um, when, when biblical figures and saints have a, an object like that, an identifier, it's called an attribute. And David is usually identified by a harp. Barbara is on the end over there as well, and she has a tower. And this is because her father locked her in a tower when she was young to, to protect her virtue. So that concludes our brief tour of All Saints Thornham. There's still lots to see, so I hope it's whetted your appetite to maybe visit one day or visit a church near you even and see what you can discover there. As you can see, there's so much lovely stuff in here to protect and look after for the future. And um, this sheeting here is demonstrative that there are lots of bats in Thornham Church, and which is why we're here. We're hopefully working with the church to help protect their heritage into the future. Rachel, just um, while it's fresh in our mind, um, there is a question um, for you, which might be nice to do just while it's, while it's there, because um, in between. Um, before we move to Phil. And uh, the, the question from Dave is, would the roof of the church have been thatched originally? I don't, th I don't think so. I think there was, um, there's quite a tradition for um, tiling and also using lead on church roofs back, um, back to the medieval period. Perhaps one of the earlier iterations of the church, um, it might have, the, there would have been an earlier building there, there might have been another, um, maybe more of a wooden structure before the church that there is now. Um, so that one may well have been thatched, but the one we see today is um, likely to have always been um, the way it is now. Um, and the, there's another question that was, is it under the care of the Church's Conservation Trust? Um, I don't believe it is, I believe it's a, it's a Church of England. Um, yes, yeah, it's still a Church of England church yeah um and the final question is is the church open to, for visits and services at the moment um i'm i think it is on some on certain days but um we will i'll, I'll write in at the end um about that specific because it's quite specific days that that's um that that's open um so yeah exactly like you said without further ado then um Shall we pass you on to Phil? So Phil, whenever you're ready, um, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. It's amazing to see so many people. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Annie? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Sorry yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can't hear you yet. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll share my screen. Okay, is that up okay? Yes, yes, yeah. you can see that, Bill, that looks absolutely fantastic. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I see that there's uh, a few people that, well, actually, I've just got to start my clock and I don't go over, hold on a second. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I know there's a few people that were here at Hayden. Um, I've got less time to talk here, so we've cut out quite a bit of the talk. So for this one, we're assuming that most people know something about bats and really we crack straight on with um, bats in Norfolk and particularly at Thornham. Ooh, I've had this problem before. Yeah. 
Okay. So for those of us who live in Norfolk, we are blessed with so many churches. And uh, recently I got all my church books off the shelf and put them on the floor and photographed them. And I think my wife was quite aghast by how many I've accumulated. Uh, she, she keeps telling me I don't read them all, but they're a, a, a fantastic um, basis of being able to, to look at churches. And I'm interested in the churches, not just in the bats that are using them. Now, over the years, we've been lucky enough to survey over, well, almost 270 churches in Norfolk now. And we've sort of plotted the position of all these. So all these red dots are churches that I've surveyed. And I, I look at that map and I think, yeah, no, we're getting on pretty impressive. And then all the blue dots are the churches that I haven't even visited yet. And Norfolk has got almost 700 medieval churches. So it's the largest concentration of medieval churches in Europe. So we're really blessed to have these. Now, as part of our assessments of these churches, we've graded them as to their level of bat use. And the highest level um, typically is going to be a church that's got over 100 bats using it. And you can see these red dots on the map illustrate these churches. And they include two of the churches I'm going to talk about tonight, mainly Thornham, um, which is on the Norfolk coast, right? That sort of red dot right at the top next to the picture. Um, just move there. So that's Thornham there. But also this one, which is Gate and Thorpe. And this is one of Norfolk's special round tower churches. And 10% and of the churches we grade as this high level use. And a high level use is, is a church where certainly people are aware they've got bats, they can be causing significant issues to the users of the church. 33% of the churches we've surveyed, we've graded as having moderate level bat use. So this could be um, large numbers of non-breeding bats up to small maternity roosts. Uh, I should have said the high level churches are always going to be large maternity roosts and, and again spread fairly evenly across the county. But most of the churches that we visit have low level bat use and typically this might be up to about 10 bats using the church often the people that look after the church aren't even aware that bats are there and sometimes we've gone and the church warden is is quite surprised when we point out some bat droppings to them um, they weren't aware they were bat droppings they actually thought they were mouse droppings and sometimes they put little tubs of mouse poison down to kill them thinking they were mice and if you add all of those percentages up it comes to almost 100%. So out of that nearly 270 churches, there are only four that I've visited in Norfolk and we haven't found any bat evidence. And this is significantly higher than the national um, survey that was carried out by the Bat Conservation Trust a few years ago, where they, they estimated 60% of medieval churches had bats roosting. So Norfolk, extremely high and over that time we've recorded eight species of bats using roosting in Norfolk's churches and I've put them here in the order in which they have been sort of um, identified during the surveys so that is almost 50 percent of all the species that we have in the UK we find in Norfolk's churches now, the, the commonest species in, in terms of frequency that they occur in churches is this one, which is the common pipistrel. And this is the sort of one of the, the pipistrels of the subject of tonight's talk. And they occur in 84% of the churches that we've surveyed. And hopefully, if this is going to work, you will hear. that on a bat detector, 
these are the pulses and the clicks that come out of the mouth of the common pipistrel while it's flying around the church, um, echo locating. Now the other pipistrel that we find in Norfolk's churches is this one, which is the soprano pipistrel. And whilst it's not recorded in so many of the churches, so we've recorded it in 55% of the churches, the soprano pipistrel tends to make much larger roosts. And the largest soprano pipistrel roost in a church in Norfolk uh, is with juveniles is probably getting on for about a thousand bats. So it's incredibly large. And the soprano pipistrel was only split from the common pipistrel probably a couple of decades ago. Um, until then, everything was known as common pipistrel. And on a bat detector, it's got a slightly higher pitch because it's uh, obviously soprano um, when you're in a choir, higher pitch singing. So, and, and both of those bats occur at Thornham Church. The largest roost we've got is the soprano pipistrels, and we've got approaching 250 bats using the church, smaller numbers of common pipistrels. Also at, at uh, Thornham Church, we've got low numbers of brown long-eared and occasionally serotine as well. So why do bats use Norfolk's churches? One of the reasons is probably loss of habitat. Um, we're all for tidying up the countryside at the moment. Dead and dying trees, which would have otherwise supported bats, are often chopped down for health and safety. Um, in Norfolk, we don't have lots of old ancient trees, so that's, that's probably one reason. Um, many, many barn conversions take place in Norfolk, and this barn here could potentially have had a large bat roost using it before it was converted. And if we went back 20 years ago, a lot of these barn conversions were taking place probably without even any bat surveys. So we wouldn't have known if bats were present there and the impact that these conversions had. These days it's very different. Now pretty much every development has to have a bat survey and appropriate mitigation. But whether that mitigation is good enough to maintain bats in a converted barn is sometimes open to question. And if a church is close by, those bats might get pushed out into the local church. But I think the main reason, particularly in Norfolk, is the importance of the church within the landscape. This is um, Salt House Church, also on the North Norfolk coast, a bit further east. And Salt House is a tiny little village and you've got this great edifice of a church. And it's always the most important building in the village, would have been you know, there for hundreds and hundreds of years and probably bats have been accessing these churches for all that period of time. And also in Norfolk, we've got the Norfolk Wildlife Trust and they're promoting good biological, ecological management of churchyards. So when churchyards are not mown every week, we end up with sort of long vegetation that can support insects and moths that the bats are gonna be able to feed on. So how do bats use churches? So we've already seen from um, Rachel's presentation, a picture of Thornham Church, and this is it viewed from the um, south. So we're looking at the, the rather squat tower. And this is the hammer beam roof within Thornham Church. And to a bat, this is like an ancient woodland. This roof is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And you can see the principal rafters, the common rafters, the purlins, the ridge, and where all of these timbers join, they will have the old fashioned mortise and tenon joints, which are pegged. And over the years, the oak has pulled away and allows bats to be able to get into these joints and roost. So as I said, to a bat, this is a replacement ancient woodland. And sometimes on the wall top, you can get big voids that bats are able to access and use. And even the posts that support the roof timbers, when they pull away from the wall, you can see the gap here. And if you look at any church where posts, where you've got bats and posts have pulled away from the walls, 
you will see bat droppings on, or may see bat droppings on the wall, telling us that bats can be roosting behind those posts. Conversely, if we go into a church like this one, obviously this isn't Thornham, but this is a, a, church, a medieval church that has been heavily restored in the Victorian times. And you can pretty much guarantee that whilst you might find evidence of bats using it, it will be fairly low key. And the reason is there's just nowhere for bats to roost, or very few places for bats to roost in that church. Sometimes when you go into a church and you look up at the roof on the inside and the outside and compare them, and we did one in Great Yarmouth today, and they didn't realize, even the church warden didn't realize that they'd actually got a roof void in there. And it's only when you actually compare the, the two shapes of the roof, you realize with this barrel vaulted roof, that's going to support a roof void above it. And sometimes bats will use these roof voids, sort of more typically, maybe long eards using something like that. And occasionally, when you go into a church that might be heavily modified by the Victorians, and you can't see many roosting features, but you will still see the odd evidence of bats, look really, really carefully. And they may be roosting in places you don't expect, like in the folds of curtains over doors. And on this particular curtain, there were five pipistrels, common and soprano, roosting on that curtain. Now, we all know of bats in the belfry, and certainly, I mean, I'm not sure how it works in the rest of the country, but certainly in Norfolk, we don't tend to get lots of bats using the belfries. And you can see here in this one, there's quite a lot of light coming through the louvres, and they're often quite windy places. Also, if the louvres aren't sort of well maintained, they can be full of pigeons and jackdaws, and that seems to be a bit of a deterrent as well. But as with life, everything in life, there's the odd exceptions. And in this um, mortise joint in this bell frame, we had a large natras roost using it. And this was a, a round tower church, and the bells were rung every week. So even sort of disturbance like that doesn't always put bats off. Below the bell chamber, there's usually another sort of separate room called the silence chamber. And in this one here, you can see the put log holes where the scaffolding would have gone when it was built. And these often, the walls are quite thick. And if you get cracks and crevices into the walls, they can be quite good places for bats to hibernate because it sort of maintains sort of temperatures above freezing, but also maintains high levels of humidity. So how do bats get into a church? Most typically in most parts of the country, the place to look is the door. And here, this is at Cly, another church on the North Norfolk coast. And you can see lots and lots of bat droppings on the door here. But on the top right, you can see this heavy staining. And this is from the fur of the bats where they're continually clambering over the door. Sometimes bats will go out at the wall top. And this is actually a photograph taken at Thornham. And uh, we've had not massive numbers, but bats uh, leaving the church. And if you can see sort of just to the left of that principal rafter there, there's a gap where it's not blocked with a piece of timber. And the bat, that's how uh, a number of bats access over that eaves level and out of the wall top. At other churches, and this includes Thornham, bats can actually access via windows. And this is one of the clear story windows at Thornham. And I'll show you some video in a little bit. And you can see all of the droppings on the window. So when you go in looking for um, ways bats are accessing the church, it's not always going to be at low level. I mean, these clear story windows at Thornham are many, many meters up. And realistically, the only way you're going to see those drop-ins is with a pair of binoculars. Sometimes bats may never come into the church and they may be roosting on the outside, so under slit tiles. And un under this tile here, um, we had evidence of three different species of bats gaining access to the void that was under that ridge tile. Or bats may roost in holes in walls. So uh, typically a hole like the one you see on the left hand side, a little tiny hole that the bat has got to squeeze into that might give access to a bigger void behind. Not a large hole, like some people might think that you can see on the right hand side, which actually had a little owl nesting in it. And then 
you get some really fab places where bats roost. Um, this was a, a church out in the Norfolk Broads and we were surveying it one morning. My daughter called me on the radio and she said, Dad, you've got to come around and have a look at this. And we had bats going down into this grave. So it was like real Batman stuff. Just... So how do we know what kind of bats are using churches? We carry out activity surveys. So um, a lot of the initial surveys we do are, are done, done, carried out during the day, looking for evidence of bats. But the activity surveys we have to do at night when the bats are flying. And that picture top left, um, that was taken a few years ago. Carl, my colleague, and a couple of volunteers from the church. And in those days, it was really, you looked to see the bats coming out. And when it got dark, you'd had it. Because although we had bat detectors, we didn't have the equipment to be able to see the bats flying in the dark. Um, bottom right, not only um, people come and watch bats, but uh, our dog comes quite a bit. Uh, she's a bit useless at counting though, um, but she likes getting involved. But the top right and the bottom left, these were two photographs taken at Thornham this year, and they were taken in complete darkness. Now we have access to thermal imaging, we have access to infrared. And in those photographs, those are volunteers um, that were helping us do the surveys at the church. We try and make life as comfortable as possible for our volunteers. So um, Polly that volunteers with me, she had the little screen, but Helen and Calvin, I think I saw Helen was on the waiting list to come in. I make them feel really at home. I, you know, we make them a cup of tea, or they make us a cup of tea at least, and we give them the big TV screen. And Helen likes, with the clicker, counting the bats out at, at the window at Thornham. Now, some bats, some churches actually like the fact they've got bats. And this is a, a guide to Tibbenham Church in South Norfolk. And they use the fact they've got bats to advertise a, a children's guide to the church. But if you will have seen this picture on the last talk, but uh, quite clearly some churches don't like the fact they've got bats. And it's really sad when you go into a church and you see signs like this, um, almost apologising for the bats. And I like to go, when I go into a church, I like to look in the visitor's book and I like to see what people have said. And it's, it's quite interesting when you look through the visitor's book at Thornham, there are some anti-bat comments, but there's a lot more pro-bat comments. And I th I've noticed one or two comments where people are quite upset. They go into the church, they see all the bat evidence, but they can't actually see the bats. And that's something we're trying to address. But what do you see when you go into a church? This isn't Thornham, but this is one of the project churches in Norfolk. The most obvious evidence of bats using a church are bat drop-ins. And this is sort of several weeks accumulation in a church that doesn't get cleaned very often. But clearly, you know, for people that are using this church, this level of bat use is just not acceptable. And uh, you can look at pews. The urine is slightly acidic and it will damage the polish on pews and brasses and things like that. So that's another sign that bats are using a church. And then you get damage to um, metal objects. And these are the organ pipes at Thornham. And you can see all the white marks on the organ pipes. So this is bat urine that has marked the metal. Rachel's always told us, already told us about the fantastic rood screen at Thornham. And you can see these um, slabs in front and they're absolutely coated in wet urine. And that is also landing on the rood screen and there's a lot of droppings on the rood screen. So that's probably or possibly causing some damage. And this is one of the other slabs at Thornham Church. And this is directly under one area that the bats roost. And the urine, I think it's, it's limestone, and the urine has actually eroded away the stone over the years. So what have churches done to resolve their bat issues? So some churches were on the top left. Um, there was a nice brass eagle lectern, and that's covered over. And they ask you to, um, if you want to take a photograph, take the cloth off and then take your photo and put the cloth back over. 
but clearly that's sort of not an acceptable way really um one or several churches we've had stuffed owls plastic owls trying to um, chase the bats off and you can see the amount of bat droppings on that owl there that it's actually made no difference at all um and you know they're, they're sort of fairly uninvasive methods we've started to find these in one or two churches and this is something that people have bought from america and they're actually advertised as bat scarers so to use this in a church where you've got bats is highly illegal um, without a license we've also found things that have happened in the past in norfolk churches so we know of at least two churches where they've lit sulfur candles and the following morning picked up hundreds of dead bats where they've, where they've had a, a, a problem. Um, at least two churches we know have gassed the churches with cyanide to try and remove the bats, quite horrific. And one church used to have a regular bat whacking night. So the bats came in over the door, they used to catch them in a net and whack them to death. Now, these are all things that went on, hopefully, in the dim and distant past. Um, but we, you know, we're hoping that in working with churches, they can be um, much more understanding and accommodating. So uh, first case study, Thornham itself. And here you've got the, the hammered bream roof looking down towards the tower. So this is taken from the chancel and it's got these sort of amazing metal tie rods going across. And we've surveyed Thornham Church for quite a few years now, um, pre the Bats and Churches project and then as part of the project. And this, this plan just shows the sort of level of bat use across the church. The main area that the bats are roosting are in the nave sometimes they're right under the ridge but quite often they're just on the south side and they tend to nest where the principal rafters are and that's the circle in green their secondary access point and tends to be mostly the common pipistrels go out via south aisle and that's the circle purple but the main roost um, is the red circle and they are going out via the northwest clear story window. As I said earlier, up to about 250 bats. And this video hopefully will show you the bats flying around. Is that coming out okay? Yeah. So I've put a circle there where the roost is. And at any time within the church, you might have 30 or 40 soprano pipistrels flying around. Um, they don't all just come out of the roost and immediately leave. They might spend five or 10 minutes flying around. And obviously all, all that time they're depositing droppings in urine. And then this is the Northwest Clear Story window. And you can see the bats. So this is the view Helen has on the um, big screen when she's clicking them out. And you can see they go out through that little triangle. So it's quite a, well. quite a weight when you've got sort of 250 bats trying to get out. Um, so this year, we weren't able to get in the church straight away to sort of carry on with our surveys because all the churches were locked because of COVID. So it was a little bit later. And the first time we went in, this is what we saw. Um, piles and piles of droppings on the sheets. The, you can't really see it on these, but the cloths are actually covered in pipistral droppings, the tables, the urine, um, yeah, sort of, and, and it was like almost sticky to walk on the carpets. The other issue, uh, which often isn't sort of brought up with bats and churches, but where you've got large roosts, quite often you're going to get grounded bats. Um, they might be dead, and finding dead bats can be distressful for people, but also quite often you'll get juveniles grounded, and then they might have to go into care before they can be released. So what have we done previously, prior to the Bats and Churches project, to sort of try and enhance roosting at Thornham? A few years ago, they did some work to the South Isle Roof. And whilst they did that, we took the opportunity of attaching some oak boards to the bottom of the exposed rafters. 
So along that edge there, there are gaps. The bats can get up behind. And basically what we've done for the sake of a, a couple of boards is we created a bat box. We also put up some um, proper Kent bat boxes that we make on trees in the churchyard. Now we haven't actually seen any bats using the bat boxes at Thornham yet, um, but at other churches they are quite well used and you see some soprano pipistrels in this box here. We also put a poster up at the church because we wanted to sort of try and educate people about the bats in the church and this is obviously something that the project is going to continue with. And as Megan said, we also have carried out a number of bats and churches nights and, and almost this is a replacement for what we've done previously. And last year we had over 150 people came and it was almost like that scene out of Jaws where um, they see the, the shark from the boat and they go like, we need a, a bigger boat. It was almost like we needed a bigger church to accommodate all the people. But it, it was, and, and trying to organise people to watch the bats emerging from the window on the outside was uh, quite challenging. Um, but everybody got involved with everything we did, the batty crafts, these were the, uh, the winners of, of, the, of the make a mask and hat competition, actually incredible. So taking that forward to the Bats and Churches project, as I said, um, we've identified the main access points as the soprano pipistrels, the red circle, the common pipistrels, and the odd soprano pipistrel, the purple circle. So to try and um, encourage roosting for the bats going out the south aisle, um, we're going to be installing some bat boxes between the rafters um, so effectively, this will be a Kent bat box lying sort of on, on its back, a single slot. And initially, the bats will be able to come into the church um, through the box, um, but hopefully start to investigate those boxes. And then phase two will be to complete the box. And then when the bats come into the church, um, they'll be contained into the box. And we'll demonstrate use of that by um, installing these bird box cameras into the box. Um, but for the main soprano pipistrel roost, the main sort of issue with it is that it's on the north side of the church. And it's always easiest to try and build your bat roosting into where the bats are accessing the church. They, they're more accommodating of changes I've found in changes of roost rather than changes in access points. So the plan is to build a bat box. We're not quite sure whether it's going to be on the inside or the outside yet, but um, this will be built for the spring um, and it'll be in two phases. So initially the bats will be able to come through the window um, there as they do at the moment, um, but they'll be coming through a box. So hopefully they'll start to investigate the box and then phase two will be to complete the box and once we've shown that they'll demonstrate again using cameras and things um, that we can then um, contain them within the box. Um, this will have to be heated because it's on the north side of the church. So that's sort of uh, one added complexity. Um, but again, this will have a camera. Um, and we tried some experiments last year to see if uh, we could sort of try and encourage the bats to change their access point and move to the south side. So one of the things we did under license, and you can see me on the cherry picker on the outside there, is we put a, a temporary exclusion in the window and we had a rope coming down to see what happened if we stopped the bats, this was at the end of the breeding season, to stop the bats going out of that window to see if they would switch their access to the south side. Um, but after sort of a, an hour, they hadn't, they just kept landing on the thing and everything was swarming around. So we had to pull the rope, rope to release it. And one of the uh, other things that, as I said, we're going to put cameras in, but it's all about sort of engagement with the public. So as part of the project, those cameras, and this is something I mentioned earlier, people coming into the church, signing the visitor's book, upset or dismayed, they can't actually, you know, they expect to see the bats in the roof hopefully in the future they're going to be able to because we're going to have a TV screen in the sort of sitting area 
where people can make tea and stuff like that and hopefully be able to sit there in comfort and actually watch the bats in the roost. So just um, almost on time but just a couple of other quick examples so this is gate and thorpe church round tower church this is the other one i showed on the map um, this was um, the the nave was re reslated probably about six years ago now um, and the bats emerged common pipistrels emerged from this crack in the wall on the gable end so as part of the prod as part of the re-roofing works at virtually no cost apart from just making this bat box you decided to build a bat box into the wall next to where the bats access the church um, and that's on the top left that's the green circle and the green circle on the bottom picture that's the rebuilt slot where the bats could get back into the church and the bat box is immediately behind that but at the same time we built a, a slot under the ridge tile as a sort of enhancement for roosting and um, what we've found so originally we had 80 common pipistrels using the church um, we've now increased the number of common pipistrels to over 100 and they're actually using the slot under the ridge so they've moved out of the church and we've actually got a roost of soprano pipistrels have actually moved in and taken over the back box and this was uh, bats emerging on one of the bat nights a couple of years ago. And we counted over 500. So we've now got over 600 bats using that church. But the majority, hardly any of the bats actually go into the church at all now. So the common pipistrels are roosting on the outside under the slot. And the soprano pipistrels are roosting in the box and then get in between um, the the boards here and the and the felt and the slates so this is a little video we put a camera up so the ones flying in this this was before the common pipistrels moved out the ones flying into the slot are the common pipistrels and the ones walking out of here were the soprano pipistrels and um, this sort of got delayed from the spring but as part of um, the project, what we're now going to be doing, the red circle will be to block off the access so definitely no bats can get into the church. We're going to be building an extended bat box under the eaves there to increase roosting. And then the blue lines show um, a section of board that is going to be removable so that we can actually clear the bat droppings out from time to time. And they're just very, very finely uh, and I only put this in late today, I just suddenly thought it'd be a good idea. This is uh, St Andrew's at Field Dorlings, it's another of the project churches and this has got a, a moderate sized common pipistrel roost, 50-60 bats and they access just there in the southeast corner of the nave. Um, again sort of post Covid lockdown, um, they, there were lots and lots of drop-ins in there this year Last year, they had to um, re-lead the chancel and we took the opportunity of actually building in one of these um, bat slot boxes under the eaves. So the bats access the church just there. Um, that's got a camera in it so we can monitor its use. And then at some point later, um, possibly as part of the project, um, if the bats start to use this uh, roost, then it will be possibly possible to block that off. And then the bats are sort of contained into the bat box. And these bat boxes re really work well for pipistrels. And the, the reason I just put this example in is um, for people contemplating repair works coming up in the future where they might not be part of the bats and churches project think about if you've got bats in your church are there features that you can incorporate at the time you're doing the works that might be able to support bat roosts at a later date it's a i mean that probably cost a hundred pounds to put in while they were doing the works clearly if you were having to build put scaffolding in to put it in separately it's going to cost a lot more so just just you know as part of your bat mitigation sort of plan ahead as part of your works 
And I believe that is the end. I'm sorry, I'm five minutes over, Ione, but. <laughs> no worries at all, Phil. That was really interesting. And I now need a beer because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you want to just stop sharing for a second, yeah. Um, and I know we've, I've just said in the chat, but I know we've run over a little bit, but there are a couple of questions that be, that are really interesting. Um, so it'd be nice to just squeeze in those. If anyone needs to um, knock off, obviously we're slightly over seven, so absolutely do. I put the feedback form if you want to, um, feedback <laughs> in the chat as well um so yeah it'd be great if you could do that but obviously no pressure so phil there's just one a couple of questions i thought were pretty interesting there's lots of interesting questions some of them people have answered other people have answered which is nice that the chat's been very vibrant during your entire talk um okay. yeah um so one of the ones was here is from david which says do you know why the two different pipistrelle species mainly use different entrances? And is there some ecological reason for that? Or um, do you know? Um, at, at, at Thornham, I've no idea. I mean, um, it's just always been the case. I mean, you get the occasional common pipistrelle will go out of the soprano pipistrelle access and vice versa but as you can um, imagine when you're listening to 40 bats flying around trying to pick out which one is a, a common amongst 40 sopranos is actually quite difficult at gate and thorpe obviously they're all using you know they were using the same access point so um, i've never had common pipistrels and soprano pipistrels using the same roost. So we have had them using the same access point. I've never had them using the same roost, even where you've got both in a, in a church together. And I know I did ask a question on the Bat Workers Facebook forum about that years, a couple of years ago. And I, I think everybody was saying the same. No one, no one else had seen that. So. Interesting. Um, and then another question from um, Steve says, do you ever um, prime the bat boxes with bat droppings? Um, you know, to like you would, you know, play bird sounds or something to get them to use the roost. Um, we have done, and I don't know how successful. I think there's there's you know different camps as to how whether that actually makes any difference. Um, a lot of uh, I, mean, I mean, certainly when we're putting the Kent boxes up and we've got them up in many churchyards and um, like the crematorium at Kings Lynn and where there's lots of bats, bats will find and use them very, very quickly. And with it, I mean, the, the whole idea within the church, the idea of putting these bat boxes in is to give bats time to find them before you start to try and manipulate the bats behavior to you know block off accesses and things like that and bats are very very inquisitive and if you can recall back to the video showing the bats flying around the roof that although they were coming out from the joint where i had the red circle you can see them constantly landing on other roof timbers and they'll sort of crawl in and crawl out they're very very inquisitive particularly when there's young flying around so um i have so going back to the question, I have put bat drop-ins in boxes, but I don't know how successful it is, whether it makes any difference. Thanks, Phil. Um, there's, there are a couple of more questions about um, bat boxes. Um, mm. One of them was about whether you can just put up a box from Charlie. In fact, Charlie's got a couple of questions about bat boxes. Um, one was, can he just put one up in a church or do you need to have a license? Um, you, so... so if we're talking about um, a bat box on a tree in the churchyard um, the, and it's just like a normal bat box, the answer is no, you don't need a license and you don't need any permission. Um, to put those under rafter boxes in, um, so those are the boxes between the rafters and we, we do them to match the timbers of the church as well. Um, 
they are list A, so they don't need a faculty. Um, but the box, the bigger box that we're putting over the window at Thornham, um, that is list B. So that needs an archdeacon's permission. It doesn't need a full faculty. Um, so you don't you don't need permission like a, a license from Natural England to put a back box up but you just need to think about um, whether you might need permission from the church authorities. But if anybody's you know, got any specific queries like that, I'm, I'm quite happy to answer them if, if you wanna give them my email address or something. Um, Phil, there's some quite specific questions in there about um, kind of uh, equipment um, and about if you can have someone help you come and survey and things like that. So if you were okay to, um, if you were all right for people to ask you those more specific questions, if you could put your email in the chat for them, um, that would be that would be really helpful. Um, I just thought just one last question um, this time for Rachel, um, and just about when you have um, bat droppings and urine on things like like floors uh, like you had in front of the rude screen the beautiful rude screen there are those is that um irreversible or is that something which you can fix um it's difficult to say at the moment i think in some cases and um, some stone uh and maybe tiles as well it is possible to use certain types of chemical cleaners to fix them but when you're looking at uh, ledger stones like the ones that were in the image that Phil showed us um, they have carvings on the top of them and uh, a lot of um, commercial companies that would try and fix the staining on that would strip the surface of the stone so that would really be very damaging to the inscription that you have carved on it which isn't great obviously so um, and I and it depends there's not a huge amount of research that has gone into it so far and as part of the project that's something that we're hoping to do we're trialing cleaning techniques we are doing bits and pieces towards helping train people to clean and also thinking about protective measures that we can put into place but yeah a lot of the a lot of the um a lot of the sort of damage as it were is irreversible and especially on that medieval root screen i mean that's that's paint work that's medieval paint it will sort of flake off um quite irreplaceably and it's it is depressing and um i'll take the little opportunity to um, comment uh as well that this project is so innovative in in that respect it's something that hasn't really been done before and um for church communities uh it's 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 quite good that uh, there's people like phil who is very special and very um, he loves churches as well, which is wonderful for us. Um, but across um, about 16,000 churches across the country, there's only around 20 or so people with a license like Phil has. So it's really important that we do our best within this project to make it, yeah, to, to make a difference, really. Thanks so much for, um, for that, Rachel. You've really, you've, you've summed it up, to be honest. So that's really fantastic. That's all the time we have, I'm afraid. We, I know we could all keep on talking about this really all evening, but um, possibly there are other things people do want to do on Friday nights. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming and thank you to our wonderful speakers as well. Um, if you did have um, any more questions, Phil has kindly put his email and his um, even his mobile number um, in, in case you want to ask anything uh, further specifically about that, particularly people who are in charge of churches as well that want some advice. Um, I only, sorry, is it is it worth mentioning? If you, I don't know that you're going yeah. to, but is it worth mentioning the one on Wednesday as well? Because that's going to be very different, isn't it? Oh, good idea. Yeah, no, I wasn't going <laughs> to. <laughs> someone's got their eye on the ball. So yes, we have another. Well, part two. Uh, the bats of Norfolk returns on Wednesday. Uh, you can find the registration for that on our website. So if you want to learn about the natterers this time of Norfolk, um, for those of you that are really getting knees deep in bats in Norfolk. Um, would absolutely love to see you there. It will be um, quite different because their bats 
are pretty different. Um, and Phil will be um, sharing all about that. And you'll get to visit an, a different church this time, Saxingham, which has an enormous roost of bats. Um, so I hope to see lots of you there. I'm just copying again this feedback link in the chat if anyone wants to um, feedback about that. And again, apologies for anyone who um, couldn't come in right at the beginning. And I will put the watch again, so if you missed the beginning, on um, our website, on the events page on the Bats and Churches website, uh, probably before Wednesday, hopefully, probably by the end of Monday um, for that. So yeah, that's all from, that's all from me. Uh, so it's, good, it's goodbye from me and uh, goodbye from all the speakers. And thanks again for coming. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all.